Okay, so we were here, uh, and last time we say that uh, we are going to follow the book and the linear regression from the book, and we are going to. Uh, what was interesting is the way that the book actually tune parameter in the uh, linear regression. So instead of using math, we are doing that we know nothing, and we are just finding the parameter. So we went. Uh, we see this one, but just. So it's uh, the same one is just the uh, uh, simulated data from the model air package. And so we have a lot of points and we want to find two parameters to, uh, to be able to, uh, to draw the, the line. So who do we do that? There is, first of all, we can't uh, set up a grid. This, the, the grid is random, is what we have uh, in the, just, okay. Here, so it's a random grid. And after we are trying to see all the possible uh, line, uh, possible. And okay, okay, now what we're, okay, we're looking at what, which line is the best. And to do that, we have to compute a kind of uh, the Euclidean distance. And we do so a bit of computation. And what was interesting, it was mostly to, to review uh, the pure and um, how to um, how to compute for each set the measure distance to return a single number. So uh, I, I go quickly because I did that last week. So, but we can spend more time. But the main principle was that we have all the points and we need to get the the distance um, the average mean of the distance for each set of points with all the data uh, that we want to, um, uh, that we have in the model. So we have here for each set of points, we have the distance and the best model is the one that they are the closest. So it's just a way to optimize, like you say. Uh, okay. And we can also do some visualization the, the chapter is mostly about visualization. And this time uh, uh, we are using just a random grid. So we have this kind of visualization with the 10 best uh, model. So it's very visual, it's very visual, you know, it's just it's like that. And what is interesting, I believe is more to remember how to plot. Okay. No, I believe now it's, this part is new. So for the grid, if you remember at the beginning, we were using a, a completely random grid, but there is a nice function that we can use also expand grid. And actually it's a function that I use not for this kind of work, but I use sometimes when I have a lot of factor, just to be sure that sometimes, you know, when you have factor, you want to be sure that you define everything, even if you don't have them in the data, just to be sure. So, is the reason why I just put a code here to explain exactly what the function is doing is when you have a two factor with male, female, and for country, after you are sure that you have each one. So you have male USA, female USA. So actually this one could be, it's, sometimes it could be useful to, to know about expand grid. And uh, so here now we are using expand grid for this one, so basically because we have 25 and we have 25 times 25 observation. Okay, this part is clear for the expand read work because it's one we can use for other work. And now that we have a more um, granular grid, okay, our prediction work better, but it's exactly the same work that we did at the beginning. Just we are trying to test all our parameters to try to fit to, to find the best line. And uh, so, the, as you mentioned, the, the book talk about the optimization problem, which is basically the base of everything. Everything is about optimization. Everything is about uh, uh, being able to find some, uh, some, some local minimum, uh, some global minimum, global maximum. It's all depends how you see the issue. The, and I took, I found this picture to explain the Newton ransom and all the slides. 
So basically, you are here, then after you go here, you take here, you take here, you take here, you take here. So it's how it works. It's, uh, I dig a bit, so it's pretty standard and very useful. And the way it's always seen is less as to minimize. But you know, a minimization is a minus a maximization. You know. But usually it's mostly used for minimize something. So, okay. Uh, oh, sorry, Sandra. Um, can I jump in with a question? Yeah. Okay. So, um, I, so this is a different way of modeling than I've done in the past. And so I'm just trying to figure out with this curve, because it makes a lot of sense with this curve that we're trying to optimize. What are we, what are we trying to optimize here? Like what, what is this graph showing us that we're like, minimizing is what I'm getting at. It is uh, in, um, uh, in the optimization, we are trying, we are trying to find the zero zero, uh, we are trying to find the root. Uh, the issue, so it's all, it's, we, we are trying to find the root. Uh, like in all, you know, in all quadratics, this all, we always want to get the root. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this this might be because of my lack of mathematical knowledge or statistical knowledge. So is this trying to like, are we talking about this as like the the root mean square? Is that what we're trying to reduce? No, 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 no not at all. It was just that um, it was just uh, an algorithm to try to minimize something. So basically, you have uh, every time um, uh, when you have some kind of curve. After, if you are in a point, and after you try to see if you can get down, get down, get down, get down, and one time it's not possible for you to get down anymore. It is what is optimization. But after the issue is that it depends. Sometimes you, it's a case when you have the global uh, optimum or the local optimum, because sometimes when you have curve like that, you could be uh, in a, uh, you could be in a place. Okay, it's uh, it's small. But it's not. Uh, but you have smaller letters, so it's just an issue about optimization, and it wasn't the purpose of. Uh, it wasn't the purpose at all of uh, the the modelization because it was just to explain that it's possible without using the math, the regular math for the linear regression to find the point. Yeah. Can, can I jump in for uh, yeah. an, an idea as well, Sandra? So. So I'm going to make, I'm going to try to make a, a drawing on the screen. Like, does everybody see that circle that I'm making? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So as I understand it here, like we have the initial data set, which is just these points, right? It does not, it doesn't include the line. It's just the points between Y, you know, X and Y. <clears throat> this is observation number one, observation number two, and so on. And then... Um, we want to be able to, to find the, the least squares regression line, which is to say, mm -hmm. like, what line best fits all of these, the whole data set, okay? And, like, this data set, it looks kind of almost like it's pretty obvious. We don't know exactly if it's, like, is, is this line the best fit? Or is this line the best fit? Or you know, is this line the best fit? We don't know any of those right off. Um, also, there's the question of like, what does what does best fit even mean? Right. Mm -hmm. So, so best fit, as I understand it, best fit means if you take the let's assume that this black line right here is the best fit line then when you're figuring out <clears throat> that it's the best fit, that means that this distance plus squared plus this distance squared plus this distance squared and so on. For every single one of these, you take all of these distances from, from the line, yeah. You you take those distances, and oh, then, sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you take all of these distances and you square them, and then you add them up. Average them. 
and then you average them. I think that's the order. But, yes. in, but in any case, what you're saying is that, and, and so that at the very end of it, there's one final number that says how close this line fits. And that number represents the distances, all these different like averaged, averaged squared distances. So if you have a line that looks like this and you're like, oh yeah, I, well, let me end it. If you have a line that's like, that's like this, you're like, oh yeah, dude, I totally nailed it. This is the, this is the, the best fit. What's gonna happen is you're going to measure this, 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 all of these to this new line that you think is so great. And it's gonna, and so you're gonna measure all those distances. You're gonna square them all. You're gonna take the average and it's gonna be like, say 60. But if you do it on this, on this better fit, this, this, the original line, and you add up all those and average them, then it's gonna be closer to 10. Oh, okay. Or, yeah, because yeah. Uh, at okay. the beginning, we were using just a random grid. After we do the expand grid, and now we don't, now the grid is a continuous variable. At the optimization, we, it's not about the grid, it's try out all the possibility to yeah. find out what are the best A uh, underscore zero underscore one. And usually it's not the, it's not the classic, there is some math formula to be able to find that, but the book just want to use some uh, optimization algorithm. Yeah. So go back to the, if you go back a slide or two, Sandra, to the one that had all of the different, um, all the lines, all 250 lines, I think one more, maybe one more, mm -hmm. this one. Yeah. So all of these different lines are like guesses, you know? Mm -hmm. And like some of them are, are not even close. This one is not even close for sure. <laughs> but there's gonna be some in here, there's 250 of those lines in all, but one of these lines, maybe it's this one right here that I'm making up as I draw, is the best fit. And the way that we'll figure that out is by adding up the, the squares of the differences, the squares of the distances, I should say. So this line has a number, it's gonna be 30. This line has a number, it's gonna be 70. This one's gonna have 120, whatever it is. And, um, and whichever one has the lowest is the best fit hmm. is that minimizes the, those distances. But in, instead of just like doing, trying 250 lines and then that's, you know, a thousand, 10,000, a million, then it's that optimization that figures it out. So we're initially setting it, we're just taking a shot in the dark and so if we go back to that curve that you were saying, that you were sharing with the Sandra. Yeah, we're taking 250 shots in the dark. Yeah, so we're taking 250 shots in the dark. And so that like 60 and 120 and then like the 10 was like the Y axis on this curve is basically what you're saying. I mean, without using the math part of it. Yeah. Is that, is that what, is that what it's going on? Okay. That and makes more, sense now. Yeah, more or less. I, I think it's, what it's really talking about is the distance, the overall distance, like the added up distance of, of each of these real points from the data set mm -hmm. to the line that you're trying to, to figure out. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> that clears that up. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks, uh, Ryan. It uh, was more clear explanation. <laughs> so, bas no, no, so basically, that we do that. Uh, but honestly, it's a linear regression. So we directly have everything. Uh, if we just use the LM function, and because we will get directly the coefficient, the intercept and the, it's all the LM function. And it was interesting to uh, review what was the LM function that actually it's a list of 12. And if you do a name on the object, you can see that you have the coefficient, feed value, X level. So there is a lot of uh, uh, item. And uh, we can, uh, because the book is using this way, to find out the coefficient, but the best way should be to go directly to the, the object and to do like that because 
uh, at least you can use uh, you can use the feed value the residual directly. And just some things that he has to be clear about if we have the constant yes or no. So the it is implicitly that every time we you we uh, we write the formula like that, it means that we have the constant inside. Um, and you can also use summary. Summary could be very useful uh, if we do summary on, a, on this list, because we have the formula, we have uh, some uh, the residual value and the residual will help us, we will find, we will see another plot because basically, uh, all the assumption is like the residual as a uh, zero center normally distributed. So uh, if you have all the residual positive and with kind of slopes, you know that you are missing a lot of stuff. And uh, we have the coefficient. We also have the p-value, some tests to know, and we have the R square stuff like that. But it's not it's not the purpose of the chapter. It's not to talk about math. So we can go quickly. And actually, this part I added just because I saw that it was interesting for you to know that you summary. Uh, and <laughs> plotting. Yeah. Real quick, the other thing that I noticed about it was <clears throat> um, when we were when we put in before we did LM, um, what we were putting in were X and Y values, right? And and that's what we had on the axes before was X was down at the bottom and Y was Y was up the side. <clears throat> but those are actually the slope and the Y intercept numbers. So each each line, each of those 250 lines was described by an X and a Y, which the X was the slope and the Y was the Y intercept. And I think you can, we were saying we were specifying those explicitly in before we used LM, but I think LM puts those in automatically. I'm not super sure on that. So, so when we get coefficients, when we get these coefficients, we have the X and the intercept or the X and the Y, which says that the, the best fit line is one with slope of 2.05 and a y-intercept of 4.22. That's the best one. Yeah, it's what we have, the intercept. It's, it's OK, in the coefficient. Uh, so the book also plot the residual, which uh, could be interesting just to, uh, to check out. So OK, they, they look nice. They look like random noise. And what is interesting uh, mostly is just to learn about data grid. So data grid is also another kind of grid, but this time it was just looking to be sure that you, you are in the set of your um, independent variables. So it means that if you have x, 1, 3, 4, 5, it will put a 2. So it was just to, um, to, to use all the window of your independent variable. So after we could have some values, we can predict everything, but we only can compute the residual when we have the true value, because the residual are just a difference. So if uh, it's not possible on a point that we don't observe to compute the residual, we have the prediction, and also the residual are just the difference between the true value and the prediction. So we need to have both to be able to have the residual. And the, the core is that we are testing the homocedasticity hypothesis, which is the fact that it's a random noise. Uh, with no variance. So it's what we see here because they look like a center to zero and a normally distributed. So we have data grid, we have add prediction and add residual are two wrappers that they will add directly the predicted value and the residual to your original data set. Uh, but in, it's not exactly what we do in real life. I've never used this function, but uh, because in real life, you don't, you don't work on this data. You work on the one you have kept uh, outside and you didn't use for your model. You are doing that on your, not on your um, uh, training data set, but on your testing data set. Uh, 
I thought that it will be nice to spend some time to review how to write formula, even if it's not in the book. Uh, so we have this way that if we if we work this way, we only use the intercept only because we just have one. If we have this one, we have x plus the intercept. If we have this one, we have just x without the intercept. Now we have on x1 and x2. And this notation is to say that we are going to have the interaction. So it's in x1, in x2, and in the interaction. So if, don't forget that it's one, two, and the interaction. And also, when you want to do something quadratic, or when you want not to regress directly on x, but on log the x, on asymptotic like that, is a way that you are supposed to use. You are supposed to use i and after to write the function. But this part is outside, uh, it's outside the book, but it was a good time just to review. Now, uh, what oh, well, is on the Hi, Hi yeah. I, I have a question from the previous slide. So in this case, oh no, no, the, the, the next one. Yes, in this case, you know, x1 and x2, can so in this case, for example, can we put like a, a one variable to be character, and then the other variable to be numeric? For example, six and age. Good question. We will. Good question. It's one more slide and we have it. But good question. So I will answer. Okay, it's just that uh, it's here. Because let me just present model matrix, and after we'll go to your question. But we will answer. So model matrix, it's also a, a wrapper just to, uh, so you can explicitly look at your formula. I believe it's the only use. So for example, if in this case, we have this uh, very, very simple um, uh, table and it's a table because it's written by row, but we just have, uh, so we just have three variable and this value. So now if we want to see for the computer, what will mean this formula? It will say that we have the one intercept and after the value of x1. And in this case, if you want the minus one, we can see that it's just taking x1 and x2. This one is how model matrix work. Now we can see what happened on categorical variable, which is exactly your question. Now we have the sex and the response. So we have the character, and we have the number, and we can see that what is going to happen. This time we have, it's going to directly picotomanize, keeping just one level. Okay. It, well, does it answer your question? Yeah. Yes. In this case, we will only keep male, and then the, the, the female will just disappear. Yeah, because uh, after it's something the book didn't want to talk about it, but you know that um, all the variables in a model need to be um, independent. So if we have, because if we have sex male plus sex female equal one all the time, so it won't work in any model. Okay. Yeah, I remember there was a section on that. I didn't follow it entirely, but it was said something about like, <clears throat> you automatically know if it's not sex male, then it has to be sex female. And so, but anyway, but yeah. It just, no, it's just that in, in anything, it's about that um, you can have a relationship within the variable. So if we have uh, two, uh, you know, if we have uh, um, two uh, variables, they're always equal to a constant, it won't work in the model because they are correlated, you know, and after it, uh, it won't work. So we remove, we also we remove one level every time we have a factor. Yeah. Because I, it's either this one, either this one, there is no variability. It is, we need to have enough, um, uh, it's because of the degree of freedom, stuff like that. I don't remember exactly because I used to know that and I run a lot of segmentation and we will move always one, but, it's at least model matrix just show you exactly what is happening in the model. Yeah, I so so you know, 
so I wonder like, for example, if we change the, in this case, the response is one, two, one, two, right? Uh, what if we have uh, some, uh, something like uh, uh, two characters, Two character variables, for example, sex and color. Do you think this this model works? Probably not. Huh? Just one thing, one two one two is just a response. It has nothing to do with male female. Yeah, it's a, it's a variable, right? So I, I yeah. my my question is that suppose we change the response to color, like red, blue, uh, yellow, mm -hmm. nice, like twelve color. I think, do you think this works for this, if we have this kind of uh, uh, data, do you think it works for this model? For we the linear see, model? We can, we can, okay, we can look at basically what we just, okay, so you want. Uh, just, oh, so, want uh, so while you're putting an example together, Sandra, um, I'm gonna say, and I mean, I'm going way back to like five years ago to a grad stats class where I learned how to do this. So if I'm wrong, I'm on recording that I'm wrong. And I'm telling you up front that I, I may be wrong, but yes, you can. But I think you have to use like dummy coding and what you have to do. And again, I may be wrong on this. You have to create like a coding for those different categories within that categorical variable so that it's orthogonal so that you know that they're different. So when the parameters get estimated, you know that they're different. Now, I, again, I may be completely wrong on that, but like, I just remember something that you can do that, mm -hmm. but like, you just have to have a, like a different type of like coding that makes sure that when you do that, you are like coding it in a way where there's differences between how many categories you have. And that may also extend the parameters within your model as well. Stats people, tweet me if I'm wrong. Tell me that I'm wrong because I, 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 I vaguely remember it and I can give you some stuff on it, but it was a long time ago. But yes, there is a way to do it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just, just, wondering. Uh, just wondering how this linear model responds to character variables. Because, you know, in, in a lot of data set, it has a lot of characters. Cause I remember like the formal test, cause it was always like, cause I remember, you know, you always got introduced to ANOVA analysis of variance where you would look at like differences between means with how many different factors you have within a category, but you can apply that same test using regression. Cause I remember going back to my stats teacher about five years ago, they always used to say, you can use regression to do ANOVA or, or something like that, or you can do ANOVA to do regression. And so it, they're, they're similar, but Again, I might be wrong. Somebody tell me that I'm wrong. And I'm just making sure it's on record that I may be wrong. Look, it, it has some outcome, like a center or like give us an example and it give us like a color green, color red. Interesting. And it doesn't have color blue? No, because no. We, need, we, need, we, need, uh, we need to remove one by a factor. Because everything is comparing itself to blue. Oh, okay. So like, think of it like if you had like a, an experiment and you were doing like a control group and you had two other groups where you kind of change an independent variable on some level, yeah. you would be comparing everything to that control group. Again, that's a very oversimplification of it, but that's the way I was taught and I understood it. But at least what was interesting in model matrix, because first I didn't understand what is the use of this function, but it is really good that at least you will know for sure what is happening in your formula. So you have a way to control it. Uh, okay. So now what the book is doing is comparing model. It's not the way that we do that usually because we use math, we use R2, R squared, we use a lot of stuff, we use statistics, but now we are just going to do some kind of visualization and also to show you the interaction, what means to, to have some interaction. So now we are going to use sim three, and we can see that we have X1, uh, Y, and X2 is just categorical, you have A, B, C, D. And if we plot, we can see that there is some kind of interaction because, okay, all the A are here, 
di here this one like that so it's like that it seems that for each category maybe we, we should have a model so we can suspect interaction because we are suspecting interaction we are going to look at two models one without and one with interaction and just some code so now we put uh, so we put the grid the grid is when we use data grid so we add all the relevant x and uh, x1 and x2 uh, and after we gather the prediction that we can do for model one and model two and then after we are going to plot this grid and we are going to use facet swap so what is interesting mostly is just that in case you want to um, to review the ggplot it's just to go back to this part of the chapter because you could relearn how to uh, plot by model because now in the grid we have we have happened the two models together model one and model two and if we plot what do we see this one is the model one so if we remember model one is the one without interaction and this one is the one with interaction so we can see that in the model without interaction so we always have the same slope no different constant but we have the same slope and in the model with interaction the slope depends of the level and we can see that maybe it's better because uh, we have this uh, we have this one for the green one which look like to be more what there is in the data but it's just visualization now actually it's all i am all i have because i spent too much time trying to understand something uh oh it's not my uh, is that my last? Okay, we are going. I'm going to go back to my computer. Uh, to sh okay, because I found something online, and I saw that because I know that uh, I had a lot of questions about map. So I found this one. Uh, okay, this one is the best. Okay, and just to try to understand what it is doing, because basically we have our model one and model two. And if we want to find something, a way to happen in the same data set, all the coefficient, I found some code online to do that. And just to understand the code took me forever. It's why I stopped doing anything because, but I saw that is a good example that we can look now and to check, try to find out object by object what is happening because it's a way to review everything we have seen. Uh, so we can go uh, here. So we just need a uh, model air, broom, and tie diverse. And so this one, if we review, this one is just a way to, to create a table, but by, uh, by row. After we have a mutate, a fit, a flatten, a pmap, uh, model air fit with, but this one is the easy one. It just means that fit with this formula. And after we have broom and tidy, so now we can, what I wanted to do tonight is to try to, uh, to split each object to try to understand what it is. So it is why I don't have more, <laughs> I haven't more slides. So basically this one, so uh, it is okay what this object is. The first object. So this is just this is just a tibble of uh, well obviously your first column is your function you're going to run the linear model function and then your models are just a string object defining what models you want to use within the ln function and then your dat column your dat column is just the data set that you want to use and so when yeah. you think about it when I'll, I'll let somebody answer the pmap one but that's like the triple one it's just so exactly so now this one is object one. So we have, so it's interesting to see that uh, we have a function, we have the model, we have the, the data, everything in one table. So this one is our object one. Now the object two. Uh, so I can run it and after we can look at what he's doing. I'll wait and let somebody else answer this one. <laughs> it's gonna have to be Sky because it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> 
But you know, it's a tricky question. You know, it's uh, I spent a lot of time just to try to, but oh. I saw that you would be. Um, so let, let's so. see. Oh. Go, go for go it, ahead. guy. You got it. Um, so if I, I'm going to try. You know? <laughs> okay, sure. Pmap. I think Pmap is uh, is that we have a we have a function that we need to input many different uh, variables into one function. In this case, we make we make a the variable a list, so that the the function will be uh, so and then you know if, for any data set for each elements because it's a map is an iteration. So for every uh, elements in the data set, we will loop over any, we'll apply the function to every elements in the data set. I, I think that's how. Yeah, how and in this it. time, actually, um, is that we are doing that on object one. Object one is just a data set with two lines, but each line is just also a data set. So now we are going on each, on, um, on scene three with this formula to apply LM and then after for uh, scene three to apply LM on this new formula. But we could have different data, different, uh, it could have been a JLM, anything else. So it just, it's exactly what uh, you say that we are going, we, uh, it's just a way to do two models different directly in one. But it could have been different data set, different formula, different way. So I believe the most, what would have been most useful and maybe to use different kind of modeling for, uh, but it was just, okay. I saw, just saw that it will be interesting just to see the object. So, because so, now that we have this one. So yeah. for every row in SIM three, we are running two linear models, one with X1 plus X2, and one with x1 times x2. Not for each row, it's just that um, object one is one data, one, one formula, and one method. So we are just running two models, it's all. But the model is on a full data set. Yeah. Well, what are the, what are the different models? You the said, okay, we have models. One the, is the model this one, this yeah. formula, it's exactly what we did previously with model one and model two. Yeah. And we have the model with interaction and the model without interaction. Okay. And so we're running with interaction, without interaction, a linear model on the same data set. But yeah. the way it is written, we could have different data set or we could have different kind of modeling. And we are just, this time, just changing the formula. Yeah, okay. No, but, uh, but I saw that it was interesting because it's difficult to understand. Uh, so, so it's to give you an example, what is doing the function is that if we have object three, it's just that if we run the model without interaction for scene three, so what is happening if we do that? We can see, okay. so now this one, it's also a list. Okay, and this one, okay, so it's a list. Uh, basically, it's all we have in the LM model, the coefficient, the residual, the effect, the rank, the feed value. You know, it's, uh, if we have 13, we have one more than uh, the LM, but it's just the result of the LM model. And uh, we can see that also. Now, if I just, but it's a list, it's a list of one. So if on the list of one, if I look at the coefficient, I have the coefficient of my first model. Now we have to use flatten because it's a list. This one is object four. Object four, but now we have. It was a list of 13. So now we have just a list of 13. And each of those coefficients, so the 13, the 13 are the 13 items that come out of the living model, uh, the, yeah. the uh, linear model. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so when it says coefficients, 1.8 is from one model, negative 0 0.19 is from a second model. I'm looking at the. Uh, no, no, no. Sorry. It's just because object three is just one model. Okay. 
-hmm. It's just because I didn't use, it's just, you know, let us split, 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 split everything. And after we are going to go everything together because yeah. it was kind, you know, I find it very interesting to try to understand what was happening because uh, we know all the code. We know Flatten, we know PMAP, we know all the world, but it doesn't mean that we know how to use them all together. So now, now if we go to um, object uh, five, so now we have the triple at the beginning. Now what we are going to do is we are flatten. So this one will be a list of all the LM from the two models. And we are going to flatten. And this, we are flattened and we are muted in a fit. So we are going to see what is going to do. Okay, so what is object five? So now, okay. So, ob uh, so too bad that now, can we see something? Okay, so object five means that we have the formula, we have the model, we have the data, and now we add the fit. And if we look at the fit for each row, we have all the information for the LM model. We have the coefficient. So, so we have just appended everything together, but it's not uh, a data, it's, it's a list of lists. Okay. Okay. Now we have done that. Uh, now, if we want to be able to get the final result, we need to do, to look for wise. And after we need to summarize using Broom. I don't know why I picked this one. It's a, uh, <laughs> but uh, so it means that if we do that, um, because the book talk about Broom, Broom is a wrapper to tidy some uh, the model. So it's something useful to know. And uh, sometimes we can use the word tidy like uh, somebody is going to, uh, to clean our mess. But okay. so if we do that, uh, we'll be able to get this one is the first model without interaction. And after uh, the second one, after we have the interaction uh, coefficient. So we have to do all this kind of stuff just to be able to get all the coefficient all together. And I put the line of code on Slack because I saw that it could be a good one to review the use of PMAP and also to understand how why is that um, I have some trouble to understand. In this case, the, the sum value has a very low p value as in your model. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but it's good. And some so of them are very yeah. small. Yes, but uh, it means that uh, uh, the coefficient is, uh, is likely not to be equal to zero, which is good. So, so in this case, if it's very small, it means the coefficient is not important, right? Uh, no, I think that uh, um, when the coefficient, when the co no, um, uh, the coefficient, no, it means that the coefficient is uh, is a test to know if it is it's it's, if it could be it's uh, different or not of zero. Yes. Wait. So. Oh, go ahead, Sky. Say, say again. Oh, 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 I want to uh, like uh, know what what does those p value indicate the, the the coefficient. So again, the stats people out there, if I get this wrong, because this is on record, um, I'm going to try my best to explain <laughs> this. So this is a formal test to it, it it's it's basically doing a hypothesis test where it's trying to provide you an estimate if this. Oh, how can I put it? If it's, if, a, it's, it's a coefficient is, um, uh, we are testing the hypothesis. It's a coefficient is equal to zero because actually an what is an estimation? An estimation is just a number, but actually we have, it's not, we look like it's a number, but in, in true, it's a range. And we want to know if zero is inside the range of the value. I don't, uh, I did, but basically, when we say that is uh, it, when we say that is two uh, eight eight, we have some um, uh, maybe the true value is between two dot five and three point two. So we have a range, and what we want to know if is zero inside the range. 
because if zero is inside the range, it's not possibly to conclude that the coefficient is significantly different of zero. Yeah, so if I could, if I could maybe make it a, a little more general, it's just a formal test of statistical significance where we're trying to assess if that actual estimate is different than zero. And if we have evidence to support our rejection of the null hypothesis, which is that our coefficient is zero. And in this case, because it is low enough and you can use whatever, whatever bar you wanna use in social science, it was always P.05. And if it was less than P.05, then we would know that we could reject the null hypothesis that the coefficient isn't zero. And so that we can, we have evidence that this coefficient is what it is, what the estimate is. Doesn't necessarily mean it's true because there's a lot of things that go with true, but it's evidence to reject the null hypothesis that it was zero. I am trying to oversimplify that as much as I can. I may have got something wrong, but that's well, uh, how I kind of remember it. My, my last statistics yeah. course was before your last statistics course. So uh, it sounded pretty good to me. <laughs> Maybe no, my, my was, I, but actually, you know, I mean, I work in marketing. We don't care. <laughs> yeah, you so, know, but, because, uh, because like a long time ago, I, I did a project with my uh, undergrad uh, professor. And we did the linear model. You know what we did? Like for the, for the p-value that are really small, we just dump the variable. And until today, I don't understand why we just dump it. Uh, no, maybe it depends. I'm not sure how SAS is computing the p-value. You know, it depends. It depend. uh, I will say that some people, they use this one to say that it's above or under two. You know, you have some kind of rule if you use the statistic of the p-value, but after maybe it depends how, how, it was compute, how it was computed. But basically, in this case, for sure, it was, uh, if it's too big, uh, if, it, if it's too big, uh, uh, it means that uh, your coefficient is uh, not significantly different from zero. And, and the other thing, the other thing too is, and this is beyond the discussion of what was in the book, but there's also another metric of meaningfulness, which is the R squared. So the linear model provides an R squared estimate, which is the explanation of how much variance is explained by your model. And so you first ask the question again, I'm oversimplifying a lot of concepts here, but it's first, is it statistically significant? And if so, if those coefficients are statistically significant, how meaningful are they? And how we assess meaningfulness is through using that R squared value. Again, I'm oversimplifying a lot of concepts, but that's just in general terms, that's the way I understand it. Yeah. And you know, so for example, if we have, if we do the summary on the proclinear, we have here, we have here the R squared, and we also have to adjust R square because basically the more you put, the more you could explain. But you have to compare by how many items you have put because uh, if you put 100, uh, it's a model with uh, 10 independent variables, it's always better than a model with two. Not because it's better, it's just because the more, the more you put, the more you could explain. But so we, the best is to use mostly the adjust the adjust R square because this this one take account also the number of variable inside. Mm -hmm. But at the end, I can tell you something. In marketing, when we have a R square of zero zero three, we are happy. <laughs> so, and thanks that I study a lot just to do creepy model all the time. You, you, could spend, you could spend an entire like class just talking about p-values and the many different tests to calculate a p-value. And so it's, um, if you wanted to go down that road, you sure can, but 10 minutes of discussion is not enough to fully explain it. Yeah. And I know I might have got some stuff wrong too, so. It's really, really interesting. Uh, Sandra, did you have more or that was your last no, I, no, you know what? I didn't have because I spent too much time 
on um, on this one. Yes, I spent too much time on this one, and I spent too much time with Yarigan, but now I'm getting better and better. That's great. <laughs> That's great. This this conversation went a whole lot better than I thought it was going to, only because when I was reading through the chapter, so much of it went over my head, <clears throat> and I was like, I think I understand you know, the first five paragraphs of this and thought maybe we would all read, you know, five paragraphs and no one would know what, what was meant after that. But you guys are brilliant. You're so smart. You understand all this stuff so much better than I do. And I, 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 this was so, so helpful to me. So thank you. Um, yeah. All right. It's, a, it's it, no, it explains a lot of things um, that was a computing to me before. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I, one of the things that I kept thinking through all of this was like, how much of this is R and how much of this is statistics with R? And I feel like these, this, these chapters were a lot of statistics with R and it's, it's, and, and less of it was like actual you know, our tricks or our methods. I don't know. What did you guys think? Is will, you know, I will say that the issue is the, the, is the issue. I will, it's completely the inverse. The issue is that there is no math. So it's, uh, for me, what was really difficult is to understand everything without math. It depends how you learn. You know, uh, I study statistics. So uh, it was, I found the, I found the model, the, the chapter very difficult to explain. Mm -hmm. uh, because there is no math, but it was a way for me to see something completely different. Mm -hmm. So this, this is what I'll say. So have you ever taken a statistics course where someone makes you do these tests by hand? And calculate? No, I'm you, actually. <laughs> no, I'm okay. old, no, you say Colin, that. I'm old enough. I look, I look at the table. I used to have, I used to have the paper to look at everything. I'm old enough to remember to have I do remember, I do look remember. at the tables and that. yeah. So yeah, okay. So okay, do it once, but then like if somebody says, okay, now I have this like really dirty data set, and I want you to do a bunch of like exploratory model stuff on this. I think looking at this, it's like it's a way to scale up that, and so using R to scale up to do those things on your on the data that you have is the way I kind of looked at it. Yes, it is statistics, mm -hmm. but it is still R using R to kind of take away some of like the, I don't want to say mundane, but some of like the, okay, I'm going to calculate all the square values, you know, average them together and all that. So, yeah. so that's what I'm saying. So yeah, take a class where you have to calculate it by hand and then you'll, you'll see. <laughs> no, and it depends, you know, it depends what, uh, on which subject uh, you study, and I'm in marketing. Even if we know everything, we don't care. Yeah, yeah. So we're getting close to time. I'm okay to keep going. Um, if anybody needs to drop off, you can. Um, but because one of the other things that, that crossed my mind on all of this was um, that this, these chapters focus on linear models. But there's dozens and dozens of models out there besides just linear models. So why would we spend so much time just focusing on linear models? Or am I misunderstanding? It's because the way it's written is exactly the same for other ones. You know, if you use, um, if you look at the tidy model, stuff like that, it's always the same syntax. So once you know the syntax of one, after mm -hmm. you could apply, and it was, I didn't do the slide, but after you could add the GLM, so, it's all based after it's all based the same. So you learn about the linear model, but you are learning the way to code other model as well. Okay. So so the linear model is, tends to be the the simplest or, or one of the easier ones to, to grasp. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it kind of goes back to the early discussion of like your first job is to one, look at your data, get an idea of what is the shape of the data then pick a family of models that is best going to meet your goals to best represent that data. Yeah. And then you go into the next step, which is like figuring out the specific parameters of the data. So doing the actual calculations to get the numbers. Um, I, I mean, it's just, I think it's, cause some of these I've done before, like generalized linear models. Um, I can't remember the other ones that I've done before, but I've That's done like different. 
What is it? Ou of the lasso, the ridge. Yeah, so some of that, like some of the, the some of the. Yeah, like the unsupervised learning stuff. I I'm not very like that is like stuff that I have not used. But like, what is it? Random effects models. I've done that before. It just depends on your data. And so I think a lot of people, you know, it's standard to come across data where you're looking at an X and a Y variable. You're looking at the relationship between an X and a Y. But when you start doing some more complex models, and again, I'm oversimplifying a lot of things, but what you're doing is, is you're adding more complexity to it. And some of those models aren't easily able to visualize. And so, you know, right now we're just using two variables and, and, a, and an interaction. But like if you had like a multiple regression where you had three, four, five different variables that you included into it plus an interaction, it gets hard to kind of visualize it. And so, um, but again, that's that's just the way I viewed it is I think it's just yeah. like, it's easier to grasp, I guess, too, as well. But And sometimes the issue is that the most complex model, maybe they work better, but after you have an interpretability issue. Okay, you are very good to predict, but it won't help your client because you won't be able to tell him, oh, you have to use, you have to impact this one, this one, because everything is all together. Uh, so, okay, you are good, but there is no interpretability. Like I was, I, I don't know, I was watching, I, I don't know, have, I don't know if you've anybody seen the, the sliced stuff coming up lately, like the, there's some stuff, there's like yes. a, there's like a streaming competition that people have put together where people will do like machine learning models to try and put this stuff together. And it's just interesting to watch because like they all get the same data set, but they're using different ways to model that data set. And so um, it's just kind of interesting to see that. So, but yeah, Sky, are you yes. leaving? Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, bye. <laughs> but Slice is on YouTube. I see that on Twitter. How do you see Slice? Uh, it's on it's on Twitch. I think they're doing. They did a pilot season. I, I watched the episode last night, but it's just it, it's just interesting to see because there's just so many different model families that you can select, and it's dependent on the type of data that you have. And again, I'm oversimplifying it, you know. And it's it's just interesting to see how many models you have that you could potentially use to model your data. And these people know them just off the top of their head, and can just look at the data and figure out what model to do. No, you have a way of uh, use, you you have a way to test a lot of models, and after you find the best model family. But at the end, the main issue is that model is just a way to predict, and what you want to be able to do is to know what you could be better, what hope you change the future. And the reason why in marketing we don't choose something too complex is not because we are not able to, is because after the client he want to know okay what I have to do to improve my. Uh, uh, my share. So yep. if we say that it, it can time by time, it can, it can multiply the number of customers plus the number of shelves, there is stuff it can do. So at the end, the main issue is what do you expect from the model? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Like I was thinking about it too when I was reading the chapter. And again, like, um, like, like, like the book says, it's like some, some, it's more focused on prediction. But if you only strictly focus on prediction and trying to, you know, I think they call it like feature engineering, which I, I always thought was just like, and again, I may be wrong, but when they were saying feature, feature, I was like, oh, it's variable, it's column, you know, like what column do you put in? And, you know, the focus is trying to figure out which combination of those using a different model family can you use to have the best prediction mm -hmm. based on some metric that you're using. Yeah. Now, I, I, you know, I didn't come from a, I didn't come from a place where that was our main focus. You know, in academia, it was more like you have a theory, you develop hypothesis based on that theory, set up a study in your own variables, and then you use, you know, modeling to test those theories and to test those hypotheses, you know, and so it's just a, it's just a different approach. Like the machine learning, you know, that like the, that kind of application is something that's just not, I haven't had a lot of training with, and it's, it's just a different approach. Yeah, it seems like different. Level. That's it. Just the same stuff that they taught 30 years ago. And now they just put a new name and they just use computer power that you didn't have before, but nothing is new. It's just a just new world. Yeah. To frighten people. And honestly, it's just new world to frighten people and more powerful, but nothing is 
really knew. We just before that, we didn't have the way to, to, to use 10 different distance. We just was using the Euclidean distance. Now, when I run segmentation, I use 10 different distance, 10 different methods, but at the end, it's just to put, just to, to sort people together. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same word, just uh, same concepts, just a new word and more computing power to accomplish. Yeah. It. And the more the word, the more the wording, the more we ask a client to pay. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I mean, so, you know, I mean, it's nice to say feature, you know, I mean, again, it may be wrong. It, there's probably like a lot of steps to do it, but like when I hear feature engineering, it's like, Ooh, that's a nice $10 word, you know, like it's better than saying like independent variable, dependent variable, you know, when you say feature engineering, yeah, you know, it's, it's everybody wants that. Yeah, yeah. You know, everybody wants that, but I mean, I am, again, if anybody's out there watching this and they're like, Oh, this guy doesn't know anything about machine learning. I will tell you, I don't. And I'm just throwing words to throw words that I've heard. So I'm sure there's more complexity to it, but. Um. Cool. Um, well, let me, let me pull up if I can real quick. 